with us today, and I had the good fortune of meeting Bill in, involved in the Visioning the Future project, and that seems to have really made a difference with which what, what you're going to talk about with his involvement with studio, art curriculum, art education, pedagogy. The very conversation we were having just before lunch, Bill has done something about this. And so with that, I think we should also just so, thank you for coming. Oh, thank and you. Um, come on up here. You have their bios in here. I want you to hear what he has to say. All right. What makes it show up? Um, let's see. Well, uh, it's kind of interesting following all of the discussion of the last two days uh, and thinking about how I might impart to you what I've done and what I've been about the last uh, 35 years. So I'm going to try to condense that briefly into a shorter amount of time. Um, I happened to meet Judy and Donald in this Envisioning the Future project uh, in 2003, I was selected as one of the facilitators. Uh, and so I was f really fortunate that I could be part of this small group of people that met with them weekly, that Judy and Donald took us through a series of guest speakers and read articles, and we processed deeply this way of thinking about teaching, critiquing, supporting, coaching, how do we bring out people's unique artistic voice. Uh, this is my background uh, in a very small nutshell. Um, uh, I taught high school for 10 years in San Francisco uh, and felt that I was called to be involved in a collegiate environment uh, and teaching uh, higher level students. And then in 1991, I had the opportunity to go to Southern California, which for San Franciscans is like going to hell. But <laughs> I, Winston Churchill says something very interesting. He said, when you find yourself in hell, you just keep walking. So I've been walking in hell since 1991. It's 100 to 110 at my house from July to September. So I, it's... It is living in that. It's been difficult. When you're from San Francisco, where the fog rolls in every night, your entire body is differently wired. So I'm still adjusting after all these years. Uh, but in 2003, the same year envisioning the future, uh, I was appointed chair of the department. Uh, when I got there in 1991, there was 12 students in the art program. Uh, today, we have about 300. Uh, it's grown dramatically. Uh, and my education primarily is at San Francisco State where I got uh, a BA and an MA. Uh, and then when I got to Southern California, I was told the MA did not really have any value. And so I had to go back for a terminal degree. So I got my MFA uh, at Cal State Fullerton at night while I taught full time during the day. Uh, and that's just, that was great. My wife was in grad school and we were having our second child and somehow we navigated through all of that craziness. Um, I believe when I, before I got to envisioning the future, I was already predisposed. Uh, I think like Donald was saying, I never really fit anywhere because I thought differently than the people I tended to be around. But being from San Francisco, being around difference was normal. And everyone has a, their own voice. Everyone has their own way of being. So I was raised and taught in an environment where it was more comfortable to be left of center, because uh, that's just where everyone was. And, um, but I really thought I wanted to articulate what gets left behind if you change the paradigm on teaching. Um, what you leave behind is a professor-centered approach, which we've been talking about the last two days. When professors think they're kings and queens, they rule the roost, it's all about them, it's ego-driven, and it's not about teaching or students or preparing artists. We also leave behind an imposed critique theory which is never defined. Uh, imposed critique theory is the thing where faculty critique 
in ways that never make sense. It's different every day. It's just their opinion. And it's never rooted in any kind of theoretical framework that we can talk about. Uh, the male modernist methods of domination and power and grandiosity also gets left behind. Uh, and materialism and technological dominance being what we're after gets left behind. And I thought Susie Gavlik said it beautifully in Reenchantment of Art. And the key for me was, she says, we no longer have any sense of having a soul. There's not this deep-seated, underpinning meaning that drives the art. And that's what I'm about, and that's what I've tried to build. So in our undergrad uh, studio program, we have two degrees, a BA in studio art and a BFA. And this is what I presented to my faculty. This is what I do in my coursework. We have a five-step kind of foundation. Uh, idea, concept, direction is one. Two is choice of materials. Three, and I use craftsmanship knowing it has the word man in it. But I wasn't using it for that. I was using it because doing things well is really important. That there's an importance to teach things and teach skills and teach ability along the way. Uh, presentation and critique. And I'll walk you through how these things work. See, I think it's very easy to switch over to a feminist pedagogy without even saying the words. Because sometimes if you say the words, people get all riled up. But if you just do it different, they don't even realize you've shifted all of them to an entire different way of thinking. So we don't serve anything other than the idea. And the idea comes from the individual student or artist. That's what the art making process is about. How do they generate ideas? Where do they come from? How do they develop their own ideas? This is starting at entry level coursework. It's not waiting until they're juniors or seniors and they don't have any idea how to make their own work because all they've done is assignments. This is from the very first course they take. There has to be something from them brought to the table. Uh, it's genuine to them. It encourages ideation at a very rich level. So from the very beginning, it's about their ideas, what they think. We reject all the material-based hierarchies. Any material, any idea is important. So when they come to choose materials, you ask one basic question. What materials best work for the idea you want to talk about? It's a very simple question. If it's bronze, you use bronze. If it's a yarn, you use yarn. If it's fabric, you use fabric. It doesn't matter what it is. It serves the idea, not anything else. And we explore the interconnectedness between materials and ideas. Sometimes a young student needs help with the material they've chosen may actually conflict with the idea they have because it comes loaded with history and all kinds of things to help them unpack that, to realize, OK, if I'm going to carve this out of wood, what tradition is that speaking into? And would that be the best for the idea that I want to talk about and communicate? I actually purchased this piece from one of our female students. Uh, the house is almost that size. Everything in it is crafted by her. Every window, every door frame. It's actually a triangle as well. Um, and it stands about almost five feet tall. It's a beautiful piece. Uh, she's got um, dual citizenship in England and in America. And in her displaced sense of where she belonged, she was wrestling through how does she know what home is? What is home for her? And that, it's in my dining room. It's a beautiful piece. Actually, my wife bought it. I should correct that. I feel uncertain about a department chair buying certain people's work and not others. So I never directly buy anything. I just bring my wife in. She scoops through and <laughs> takes care of that. So it saves me from being unfair. Uh, and it's really important that I, the students know that I value all their work and everyone equally. OK, craftsmanship. Basically, how do you manipulate the materials, again, to serve the idea and the work? And that manipulation is important because that's where we primarily put our skill training. So if they want to, like I have a student right now in a Sculpture two class who's he's very immature, but he's fun, and he's funny, and he's 
over muscled and he likes to skateboard and but he likes to work with his hands so he was going to make this stuff and all of a sudden he realized he had to learn how to weld to make it so I taught him MIG welding and now he's welding away and he's going to make 20 pieces in the series that are funny and humorous and serious and but I didn't teach MIG welding because everyone has to learn MIG welding it's because it served what he needed and he got what he needed when he presented the idea. Um, one of the things we believe very strongly in that I've driven is that the work has a voice of its own. And as artists, sometimes we have to let go of the original idea because the original idea is just the driver to get us started. And then something happens in the process and the work. And if we're not listening to it, if we're not sensitive to what the work has, we will miss it. And we will then try to control the materials, dominate the materials, and it will come out lifeless. But the materials speak to us. And how do we attune ourselves to hear the material, to hear the process, so that art making is a dialogue not just between uh, viewer and audience and artist, but between artist and their stuff. And this is a hard thing to teach. How do you learn to listen to wood or clay or bronze, or fabric, or embroidery, or anything that's out there, it requires an attunement in yourself. And I think uh, Gablik's word about soul, if you don't have soul life going, you will not be able to listen and hear your materials speak to you. It's an interior place. It's, it's not about an ego-driven, I'm going to be famous, I'm going to be the art star, everyone's going to know who I am. It's about, I'm here to serve. And people who come to serve understand, for most of American culture, it was given to women, that was your role, to serve. And I had an amazing example in my own personal upbringing. Uh, my mom and dad both smoked heavily. Uh, our house, literally the walls had that yellowish, brownish coating on it, right? Um, my neighbors were Hell's Angels. Uh, it was fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know how I got there. I was sure aliens had dropped me because my dad was Marine Corps, uh, construction worker, cowboy, and I'm an artist. So it was very weird. But my mom was warned by the doctor that she would die if she did not stop smoking. Her lungs got so bad. So she stopped smoking and ballooned with food, right? She got huge. So she went to Weight Watchers. This is like 1970. She lost all of her weight and went to work. Weight Watchers. Well, in my household, women didn't work. Women cooked, cleaned, and served. My dad had his recliner, my mom had her recliner, and my brother, my sister, and I, we were the remotes, right? Because <laughs> there weren't remotes then. We changed the channel uh, on our Zenith color television. And my dad watched Lawrence Welk a lot, but even then he would describe who had manly hands and who did not have manly hands uh, who were singing. So it was very strange. But I remember the night my dad said to my mom, get me a cup of coffee. It was crucial. She turned to him and she said, get your own damn coffee. And we all waited for this World War III to explode. And instead, my dad fell in love with my mom they got remarried and the whole relationship changed because suddenly she became a person that he had been originally attracted to and got lost in a servant's role that he enforced but when she refused to be there this magic thing happened so this idea of serving and loving and engaging it's difficult to, to manage it there's a place for service there's a place for me to serve I serve my faculty I serve my students I'm there to make an environment where they can find themselves as artists and as teachers. That requires listening. We look at presentation. I drive it as important as any other aspect to the art making process. Just because you made it, how are you going to present it? What's it going to look like? You know, where is it going to go? Who's your audience? Who do you want to have see this work? And I love students. Everyone. <laughs> Okay, besides everyone, <laughs> it, do you think there's a group of people that you think you might want to have as an audience relationship with? And for undergrads, this is pushing them. This is a, this is a not 
a kind of entry level discussion, but we want them to go there. Do you want educated people to see it? Do you want people who have studied art to see it? Do you want the people who hate art to come see it? Who do you want to have come see your work? And then how you present it will either engage them or not engage them. So it's a very important uh, discussion to have. And I, I talk about this, you have to release the work. It's no longer you. It's no longer yours. If you're going to present it, it has to go public. So I do this thing with my entry level sculpture students. We put on exhibitions for their first project. Just class exhibitions out in a lobby. And so they have to actually stand there and listen to people respond to the work, not knowing they're the artists. Because I want them to learn what it means to go public. What happens when you release this work and you hear people talk about it. It's very, very important. Like birthing, I've only been at two. I haven't experienced it personally. Although I have had two kidney stones and gallstones, so I have some inkling <laughs> of the pain level. Um, critique. I have hammered in my faculty that we will not be a place that barbecues students. I went through that my whole education. There's no point to it other than ruining them and making yourself feel better, which is just a power play. We don't barbecue, we don't hurt, we don't bring to tears, we don't do all that stuff that so many schools take great pride in that we make our students suffer. We know who's going to make it or not because they endure that. It's what a waste, right? Waste of their money, waste of time, it does no good. So it's all artist-centered. So we talk about asking the artist what kind of critique do you want? And then they have to learn about what the kind of critique options there are. Yeah, there is a formal critique. Let's talk about what you've made and make some decisions. Let's talk about content. Let's take a feminist look at it. Let's take a Freudian look at it. Let's take structuralist, post-structuralist. What? And so they have to learn these things and decide how they want the class or the faculty member to respond to the work. Because every response will be different depending on the lens that you use to evaluate it. We also make a huge distinction between process crit and final crit. Now, those of you that spend any time reading Genesis, we've been given the critique process in the very first uh, chapter. I know it's not where you expect to find art instruction. But I think it's absolutely beautiful that if you look at the creation myth story, right, it's a beautiful description. There's six days of work, and at the end of each day, there's a critique of what was done that day. And the first day, all that's done is there's this big separation, this compositional decision. And the next day, some other decisions are made. And it works down. And we talk about a final crit voice is never brought into process crit. You know how many you ruin your own work when you bring that voice to it too soon? And so how do you hold off that intense, critical judgment until it's right? And I work with students who are barely perfectionists, right? And that voice gets in the way and it makes them feel bad about their drawings, their marks. In fact, their eraser is used more than the uh, lead end of their pencil. Um, they don't understand it as a drawing tool. They think it's a mistake remover, right? And that critical thing needs to be held off until it's right. You've got to make a deal with yourself. Look it. I'm going to bring you on full bore when I'm done with the work. But until then, it needs to gestate, it needs to grow, it needs to have a chance to find its life. And that won't happen if you're bringing a final critique, detail judgment on a piece that's in process. So I always ask my students, are we doing a process crit? Is it a final crit? And then what I don't, I didn't say it here, but we need to talk about what's there, not what should be or could be there. Like how many critiques do you find the whole discussion is about a piece that doesn't exist? We didn't even talk about what's in front of us. Everyone starts chiming in, well, you should use this color. It should be over here. You should make 20 of those, really, if you're going to be serious. I and mean, all this conversation that has nothing to do with what's been made it is a, a waste of time and energy. And it's not caring for the work that's being presented. So it requires great discipline to keep critique on the work. OK, this is the results that's happened for us. 
our students develop individually very strong. They think of themselves as, this is my work. They know that we want them to find their voice from the very first class they take. We will never have a look at our university. Like, I know all the students that go to Claremont, they go to Art Center, uh, they go to Cal Arts. You see the work, and you go, oh, yeah, that's where they went. Because the faculty demand that the work look like theirs. We go out of our way to make sure our students find their voice, not our voice. It's not about reproducing ourselves. It's about helping them find what they have to give to the world, their uniqueness. And so what comes out of it is they have a better sense of language. They can speak about their work. They can come at it in a much more mature way than your average undergrad. Now what I've noticed is they have no idea that they're getting something different. They think all art schools are like this. They think this is what everyone gets until they go somewhere else and they come back and they go, oh my god, you cared about me. You cared about my voice. You wanted me to succeed. And they, they really appreciate uh, what we've built. Now, some po positive aspects about our undergrad. Uh, we have sophomore and senior level portfolio reviews. Again, not to fry them. At the sophomore level, they actually have to have an intent statement. What are you going to be as an artist, as a sophomore? And we look at their intent and see if their strengths visually match their intent. And if it doesn't, we try to help them go, you know, you really, you're so strong at drawing, I don't think you know, metal sculpture is where your strengths are. Uh, maybe as a way of merging that, but we really work with them and try to line up their strengths with their goals as sophomores. Uh, we require gallery design of every art student. They have to curate someone else's work before they can have their own show. And what that's done is our solo shows are so incredibly strong because they already know what it takes to put on a show. You know, going to shows is different than putting one on. You probably figured that out at some point, that they're a lot of work. And to do it well is difficult. Um, our figure drawing, we do not allow objectification at any level. Our models that come to work with us love us because they are people from the moment they walk in until they leave. They're never a landscape. They're never an object. They're never under anyone's gaze or view. They're in a relationship with the people drawing from them. And it is a very powerful experience that these models have to drive about 25 miles out of their way because we're outside of LA. Even though we pay them more per hour, the time and gas, but they love coming to us because they're never allowed to disappear when they're modeling. They're always with us. We're always with them. We know them by name. We talk to them. We engage with them. And uh, it's very, very powerful. Uh, I had a women in art course uh, built that counts the same as any other art history course uh, for graduation. So any student who takes women in art, it can count against modern art, history uh, survey, doesn't matter. It has the same value. I also make sure that all of our historians include women in all of their lectures. So there's never a lecture from art history that excludes women. And that's been very, very powerful. Uh, part of that was because my MA committee, I had Whitney Chadwick on my committee. She wrote Women, Art, and Society. So I kind of got a sense of that even back then. In my MFA, I took a Women in Art course from Deborah Winters, who was the slide librarian, but had more to say than anyone else in the art history department. And uh, it really impacted me, changed the way I view art history. Uh, so we, were, we demand that it's equal. So th there's no canon allowed that is the old version. In fact, the difficulty is what is the new canon? What should it look like? Who should be in it? And so we make that part of the lively discussion of how do you decide? In fact, we were talking about the other day, I, I can't remember what the context was about who slips out and who comes back in and who makes those decisions. So we really have a very strong uh, commitment to that. We have collaborative teaching environments. We have collaborative learning environments. Uh, I team teach my sculpture classes with a female faculty member. Um, and I'm committed, so I do it for half pay, and I'm there every time. Uh, we both do it for half pay, but we're there full time. It's a gift. I want a woman's voice alongside mine for all of my students to have two kinds of input going on. 
and we both commit to a full-time class participation for half the money. Because if it's about the money, go somewhere else and get a different job. If we're going to train artists, there has to be a commitment from love, there has to be a commitment of service, and it can't be about the money. So uh, that's my commitment to it. Uh, our guest artists are all over the map, men, women, old, young, uh, gay, straight, doesn't matter. Uh, and I teach in a faith-based school. And so we risk a lot and bring in, and some people like Bill Viola came in a few years ago and the night before he was supposed to come, he said, I can't come there. We're like, why? He goes, I'm not one of you. We're like, you don't even know who we are yet. You're judging us by probably televangelists and a whole lot of things on television that our art department has no relationship to. And we don't expect you to be anything but who you are. Kind of a half Buddhist Zen guy who does some pretty cool videos and uh, has raised four kids, I'm not sure what else. But he, so he came, spent a whole day with us, and he decided that his experience with us tells him that the next generation of spiritual artists will be from our school. That's what he felt about it. So uh, that was pretty nice for me to hear that. Um, any questions on the undergrad before I jump into our grad program? Yes? Uh, we have uh, about 250 undergrads. And what's the gender breakdown? About half and, well, about two-thirds women and a third male uh, for the undergrad. Uh, for the grad, it's even. Yes, Judy. I have a question. How many undergraduate art programs in the country have uh, later curriculum? I don't see any. Not my experience. I mean, there's some out there probably, but I just don't see them in my experience. Uh, to me, it's just so important that, well, when I became chair, what I did with all the art faculty is we had a series of discussions that if we're building what we call the house of art, how are we going to do that? First, we talked about a foundation, and we talked about community being the absolute essence and essential quality of faculty. If we don't have a community, we will fracture, our students will not get what they need, we'll be competitive. And I looked at the Hebrew word for community, which is really fascinating. It's back. So who has your back and who stabs you in the back? It's either one way or the other, right? So I do wear a shield on my back every day to work just because <laughs> people are people, but I picture it doing Captain America's shield. So then when I hear the darts hit it, I can laugh and, and they fall to the ground. But that's so important is we love each other, care for each other, even when we disagree. That we have robust discussion, but it's not about who's on top. It's not about who's got the most. It's about how do we do this together. Yes? But it really seems like your faith and your feminism are found. Oh, they're one thing. Yeah, I'm an unusual kind of faith person because I believe in uh, women's equality. Uh, and, I, and I think, fascinating, the word for God in Genesis is plural, which is very confusing because the early uh, Jewish people felt God was one, but they could live in that paradox of plurality and oneness being together. So they, uh, wisdom was female. Sophia was the feminine aspect of God. They had no problem with it. But then the church comes along and you get it connected with Constantine and power and they destroy everything. You know, it's really sad. Um, so I think of it very differently. I think of it from a person-based experience. So to me, the women were the only one that had courage where Jesus was concerned. The men were wimps. They're all hiding. They were going to die. And the women were out there trying to find him because they loved him. And he, they knew their place. It was very powerful. Um, so yeah, for me, my faith, when Judy talked about her pedagogy, I'm like, okay, this makes sense, because every person is valuable. But I think I had to work harder, because there was no church teaching on feminism, right? Uh, I had to work harder to find a way to make it fit, but it fits seamlessly. And so uh, our students think about their soul life, they think about what's inside. And, and how important their voice is. Um, so yeah, it does seem normal to me. It's embarrassing to be linked with people that don't think this way. But 
I'm white, I'm male, I'm Christian, oh my God, I'm in trouble. So <laughs> I have to work really hard at not living out those stereotypes. In fact, uh, 33 colleges weren't interested in me before I got my first college teaching job. And I tried to hide who I was, and I realized I had self-portraits in my slide bank. I'm like, duh. <laughs> I should have submitted non-self-portraits, but it's all right. Anything else on undergrad? Okay. Um, in our graduate program, we actually have a three-year low residency program because we believe that there's a kind of a falseness at school when you go there and you have this beautiful studio space and all this equipment and for two years it's the center of your life and then you graduate and you have no studio you don't even know how to make art in your own space you don't have a space and there's this um, uh, Margaret Lazari who teaches at USC she describes it as the abyss where 90 percent of her students go they just fall into this artless place and um, so I built a uh, it took me seven years to convince the university that the MFA would be good for them, uh, for us to offer it. Uh, so I'm kind of a bulldog. I grab a hold of something and eventually I wear them out and they let me do it. So our students come in knowing that they have to have their own studio space. Because to succeed as an artist, we talked about that a little bit the other day, uh, I decided there's three things. You need time, money, and space. They never come at the same period in your life, right? <laughs> so you have to be able to juggle those three things being unevenly appropriated to you. And so if they can do that while they're in school, hopefully the patterns we build in our grad students will carry them after they graduate. Um, so we have this structure where we put research, conceptual framework, studio discipline, audience and critique, similar to undergrad, but a much heavier level. Let me explore these with you. Um, when we talk about research, I kind of help them all see that it's everything you take in. Everything you read, everywhere you go, everything you look at, everything you experience is research. In fact, I use this tree metaphor it's like the, tr the leaves are breathing in, right? All the stuff we're exhaling. They're taking it in. And so research is, is kind of a, a broad area. But we want them to begin to figure out, okay, what matters to them in that research pool? And if you've ever done research, you know that you get lost for a while before you ever find what it is you're supposed to do with it. It has that way of kind of expanding. So when they look deeper, and they spend the time trying to figure out, okay, what artists do I feel like I connect with, right? So we, uh, uh, we have them do deep research into artists that they seem to have an affinity toward. So they can maybe figure out, maybe that's language I can appropriate, that I can call it mine because there's some link there. Um, we talk about what they read, what they watch, how does that influence their art making. Uh, and so all this works together so their research uh, is equally weighted to their studio production. So we really want everything. Um, oh, by the way, this piece is, was a fantastic, this is a uh, MFA uh, graduating exhibition. I believe there's like 700 garments in this, uh, this piece. They're all cast-offs that she washed ritually uh, seven times each, and then they're hung in this beautiful color arrangement that moves into orange and red in the center. And you would walk it like you might walk a maze, and then you'd, everyone is behind you, you all end up in the middle, and all you could smell was this uh, detergent smell, and it was overpowering and beautiful, and uh, there was something about her ritual processing of these discards that was very life-giving for her and for all of us in the show. So there's a good example where any material, doesn't matter. The material was what served her idea. Uh, she wanted to find a way home. This kind of journey, this searching for the center, for what the core would be. And so she built this, this whole thing. So um, conceptual framework uh, is like the main branches of the tree. 
you know, what are the five or six or seven main areas that interest you as an artist? Um, you know, maybe there's social justice. Uh, maybe there's uh, our relationship to the earth. How do we take care of it? Uh, maybe it's a color palette. Uh, maybe it's a figurative, non-figurative, or some kind of thing that you want to do. And so they begin to identify who they are as an artist and how those branches then serve their studio practice. It helps them know what to make. Um, we require minimum 25 hours a week in the studio and they're full-time jobs. They're away from us. We're, we're uh, communicating via email and phone and Skype. Um, but that's life, right? They got to figure out how to do it. Uh, we have mentoring faculty. Faculty work one-on-one -on -one with uh, grad students. Um, it's a three-year program, so the first four semesters, they pick one faculty for each one. Then they pick two faculty for their final committee that works with them. So they get four distinct voices speaking into their process. And then when we have our residencies, we just fill their heads with feedback with guest faculty, and we'll get more into that in a minute. But the faculty don't tell them what to make. The faculty ask, how can I support you to make what you want to make? And so it's a, it's a really important dialogue that the students are in charge of their lives as artists and we're them to help them mature into the artist they want to be, which is different than most places. Uh, my son went through Claremont to get his MFA and because he's my son, he did what he wanted. But that's not normal. Everyone goes there, comes out painting color field style painting. And he came out making sculpture out of reclaimed pallet wood, which is fantastic. I, I was really proud of him that he maintained his own voice, his own way of thinking. But then as a four-year-old, he took the book out of my hands and goes, Dad, I can read that faster than you. <laughs> that was The Hobbit. So it just, you know, I was really proud of him that he did not let the grad school take away his vision and his voice. Um, Again, with audience at the grad level, we need them to define their audience. So important. Um, this gal did this beautiful works with uh, uh, crocheted and knitted uh, yarn that she would bleach. And these things, this is the smallest one. They were half the size of the gallery. And you could actually walk under them, these huge fields with uh, homes on them. And again, I think she was trying to wrestle through this notion of who am I as an artist? What did I naturally do as a child? And how could I bring that into my practice? And so she loved yarn and thread, and that's what she ended up doing. Um, we critique process it with them, but they're in charge of critiques as well. They say, this is the kind of critique I need. And then we respond. We might say, like I might say to a student, you want this, but I really see something else in the work. Are you open? to me speaking into the work, something I see that I don't know if you're seeing. Uh, and so it's a very much a conversation. Uh, and the ones that are interested, we talk about things that I'm seeing that they're blind to. Because often, when we're young in the arts, we don't know our own stuff, right? We're missing it, so it's helpful to have someone from the outside. But the research continues to speak into their audience. Uh, they have to write. Uh, we have a theory, practice, dual uh, emphasis in the program. So they're writing all year. They read 10 to 15 books a year. Uh, they actually have to write a thesis uh, along with their MFA show. Uh, if the MFA, we talked about the fact that MFAs don't make teachers. But we know a lot of people in our program want to teach. So if they don't know how to write, they don't know how to speak, they don't know how to think, they don't know how to articulate ideas, they're not going to make the cut, the one out of the 700. So we're trying to give them an advantage by pushing them to be able to do that as artists. Now we had um, a panel of gallerists and uh, one of our alums came back for this uh, presentation and he said, okay, I got my MFA at a place that's a faith-based school. Is that going to hurt me in the art world? And the four gallery owners, one of them said, Oh my gosh, if that came with a moral compass and you as an artist showed up on time, did what you were supposed to do, and I could trust your word, I wouldn't question that ever. And, and so the very kind of core tenets of 
our faith-based program, they were ready to have come in the door. And, and the other one just said, has nothing to do with it. Is the work any good? That's all I care about. So it was a really beautiful moment for the students to see that it's not a disadvantage or an advantage. You gotta work hard, put in the time, do the work, do the thinking, do the writing, uh, and just be ready for a long haul. If you want a short one, go do something else. You know, go to Hollywood. That's always short, they're usually dead. Right, as you've been following lately. Um, We, the only way we overwhelm our students, and this is intentional, is the multitude and variety of voices that they hear. That they have to figure out who do they listen to. So the voices don't ever come demanding, but they come as this is what, you know, we had Suzanne Lacey come and speak. And so they got to hear about her MFA in public practice. And they got to hear about that. The only reason she came to speak is because our undergrad program requires 30 hours of service every year from every student. So 6,000 students do 30 hours of community service every year. And she said, that's why I came to speak. And I thought, ooh, I like that. So that was good. Um, we want to clarify the critique process through instruction and dialogue. In fact, we have critique classes where they learn critique systems, they learn critique theory, we have anywhere from four to five faculty in each class. And so as a team of faculty, they experience faculty disagreeing about their work and, and arguing over what's strong and what's not. So they get to see that when it's just one faculty and students, they think that they're right. So we get to line up together and talk about their work as a group. And they get to see these different points of view kind of aired out in front of them. Um, they develop their own filters. What voice matters to them? What do they let in? What do they hold out? Um, and we bring in guest faculty, uh, guest uh, speakers, and we also have the third year students, they critique the first two year students. So as part of the program, they learn to crit themselves. Uh, so it's really important. Did you have something? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, critique is what we built our house of art out of. We think it's the one material that has the lasting input and impact on people. So how we do it is really important that we don't damage people or hurt people. Uh, Linda, where are you? Yeah, we were talking, I, I did some research and there's this Hebrew notion that if people are bad teachers, have you heard what the punishment is? It's better than a millstone be tied around their neck and cast into the lake. So that's what I carry in my head I don't want to be in the lake. I don't want a millstone around my neck. I don't want to cause anyone to stumble. I want them to excel. Because I always ask my students, okay, list the faculty that made a difference in your life. And then list the ones that hurt you. And then how many are in that gray zone? You don't even remember their names, right? So if I'm going to teach, that time I have has to be life-changing. I have to put everything I have into it. So, as I really don't want to be at the bottom of a lake for any student. Uh, so that means I have to apologize occasionally. I do. Sometimes I jump, I get excited in a crit, and I, I start talking about what's not there. And I violate my own rule, and I have to take them aside and say, or in front of the whole class, okay, I just did what I said we wouldn't do. We've got to focus on what you've made and why you made it. I think I'm almost done. Okay, positive aspects for the graduate program. Uh, well, I'm drawing a blank on who the LA Times critic was. Nice yeah, it was Christopher Knight. He said there are three kinds of schools that teach art. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> of course, right? This is before I started planning the MFA, so I took to heart what he said. He said, ugly schools teach theory only, bad schools teach practice only, and good schools evenly teach theory and practice. So I said, all right, Christopher, I'm gonna do it. Uh, we have a very diverse faculty. Uh, men and women, uh, ethnicity, uh, so our students get a really important balance. Actually, a quick undergrad story. We're hiring a new uh, full-time painting and drawing professor, and a sophomore uh, young woman came up to me and said, please hire a man. There are so many women here. I never get to hear from a man as a faculty member. And I thought, okay, I did my job. 
right? She's got so many female voices speaking into her, she doesn't even have a male teacher right now. And so she's hoping that we hire a man. So I thought that was okay. That was nice to switch it around from when I got there. It was men only, Old, white men like me. Um, our students are, uh, our graduate students range from 24 to 66 years old. Uh, half and half men and women all over the country. Uh, so it's a great mix. Uh, there's people with lots of life experience, and then there's hotshot young ones that have all the energy but don't know what they're doing. So it's a great dialogue between them. Uh, students find their voice. Uh, we get praised by all our visiting artists. Uh, our alums are practicing as artists. And we actually have four alums that are now graduate, uh, our uh, department chairs at other places. Uh, they're teaching, they're sharing what we've done in other uh, teaching areas. So we're excited about that. Um, here's my contact information if you want to carry on another conversation with me and, uh, and I can talk about how hard it is to do this. Um, today I made it sound easy. Um, just this week my dean tried to force me out of being chair. Uh, so it, it's a very challenging uh, thing uh, to bring this kind of uh, uh, paradigm shift to a place where people like